So this lecture is about complications that can occur in the mother in the postpartum period. Um, so again, postpartum is that first six weeks after giving birth. Um, the most common one that we focus on um, is postpartum hemorrhage. And the reason we focus on this one is because it is the biggest cause of postpartum mortality. Many women still die of postpartum hemorrhage, um, even uh, with our increases in technology. So the four main causes are related to the four T's, tone, tissue, trauma, or thrombin. Um, most commonly tone, something affecting the tone, uterine atony, um, is what is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage. So um, when we're talking about postpartum hemorrhage, um, it is defined as if they are saturating a perennial pad within 15 minutes, they are constituted as having postpartum hemorrhage. If they have a blood loss greater than 500 milliliters with a vaginal birth overall, or if they have a blood loss greater than 1,000 milliliters with a cesarean section overall, those constitute as postpartum hemorrhage. Um, if the if the problem is not rectified, um, then they can go into hemorrhagic shock, and, which will cause death. So when we're looking at postpartum hemorrhage, um, it can be classified as either early hemorrhage or late hemorrhage, early being within the first 24 hours, late being any time after that up to six weeks um, during that postpartum period. And this can be when they go home. Um, a lot of times the common cause of late postpartum hemorrhage has to do with retained placental fragments. So some of the medications that we can give related to this, if it's related to tone, has to do with um, tightening up those muscles. So things like oxytocin, our body naturally releases oxytocin, especially when we're breastfeeding. So we have a natural innate um, body process of of stimulating those contractions in the postpartum period. Um, we can administer exogenous uh, oxytocin as well, um, but sometimes it, it it needs a little extra help. So nursing care related to postpartum hemorrhage in general. Um, when we have a patient that's bleeding, we want to make sure we're looking at frequent vital signs. Um, and of course, stopping the loss of blood, the cause of blood loss. We need to find out what the source is and stop it, whether it be fundal massage, which is usually our first step, whether it be getting them to, to void or, or if there is a laceration that is still open that hasn't been repaired. So finding the source and stopping that source. Vital signs will help us know if they are um, de-escalating and going into a shock phase, um, as well as the oxygen saturation levels, um, assessment of the fundus. Um, most commonly, it is going to be some to do with uterine tone um, and we would be able to assess that by assessing for a boggy versus a firm uterus. Measuring intake and output, if urine output starts to decline, that can be a sign of shock um, impending as well. Um, as well as providing any kind of additional support like IV fluids, um, blood transfusions, etc. So again, the most common cause of this is uterine atony or lack of tone of the uterus. Um, and there are lots of reasons that this can happen. Um, anything that causes the, the uterus to blow up larger, like a macrosomic baby, for example, can cause this. Moms who have had multiple births, the more times the balloon has blown up, been blown up, the, the harder it's going to be for it to contract back down to its original state. If they had medications during um, pregnancy or during labor that would decrease the, the uterine contractions, the urtocolytics, things like magnesium sulfate and terbutaline that we use either to stop preterm labor or like with magnesium sulfate, we use it for preeclampsia. Those can still affect those, those muscle contractions after birth as well, um, causing difficulties with developing that tighter tone that we need. Um, so the reason this is important is the, the uterus, I'm sorry, the placenta that separates from the uterus is about the size of a dinner plate. It's pretty big. So the wound that's left from the size of that, that placenta separating is big, and it's full of open areas of blood vessels. So our muscles act almost like a tourniquet. As they squeeze down, they're cutting off the blood flow to those open blood vessels and stopping that blood flow. If we don't have those muscles to, to squeeze down those blood vessels, then the patient can bleed out, and sometimes pretty pretty rapidly. So when we're looking at um, this being the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage, the first action we have if we have a patient who we notice is having a large amount of blood flow um, in, of uh, lochia, 
is to perform uterine massage or fundal massage. So using your hand, um, almost like kneading dough, you're pushing with the heel of your hand or with your fist sometimes to kind of gnaw on into that, that fundus, aggravate it a little bit, and it'll make those muscles contract. So that is our first line of defense against a non-toned uh, uterine fundus is to, to irritate a little bit, Massa m fundal massage. Um, if it is... If that doesn't work, we can get the mom to empty her bladder. The second most common cause is urinary retention. Because of that bladder being full, it pushes up on that uterus, doesn't allow it to contract down properly. Um, so that can cause uh, uterine bleeding as well. Um, so getting them to empty their bladder, especially one of the big differences you'll see is if it is midline but boggy, that's probably more just that tone and needing funnel massage. But if it's displaced to the side, if you're assessing the fundus and it's pushed over to the right or the left side, it doesn't matter which side, um, then that is more likely where the bladder is pushing up on that uterus and pushing it off to the side. So that when you see displacement of the fundus to the side, think more of bladder being the cause. Um, so our biggest intervention, fundal massage and emptying the bladder um, will hopefully bring us back to that uterine tone that we want. If that doesn't work, they can give medications as well. Biggest one you usually think of is oxytocin. Um, there's also methyl ergonavine, um, which is a medication that helps with uterine contractions. You want to avoid methyl ergonavine in patients that have hypertension pre-existing because it will increase your blood pressure or, or can increase your blood pressure. Um, you want to avoid uh, another medication is carboprost, um, which is a great um, tocostimulant. However, um, this medication you want to avoid in asthmatics because it does have a beta effect. Um, and then another medication that helps with cervical um, closure is our um, cervical, um, pro, uh, not cervical, prostaglandin um, release is your mesoprostol, um, which is given usually rectally, um, and that helps with those contractions as well. So if tone is not our problem, if we check tone, um, we've emptied their bladder, and that doesn't seem to be the cause, then we start looking at is there any kind of lacerations of the reproductive tract, especially ones that either have not closed all the way or um, that were unnoticed. So the ones that are on the exterior along the perineum are usually easy to see and easier to repair um, along the outside of the vagina, but they can have tears on the inside as well. Um, they can have cervical tears or interior vaginal tears as well. Um, the cervix, the reason they don't want women to push before they are 100% effaced and 10 centimeters dilated is because it can it can tear that cervix. And cervical tears are pretty um, detrimental. Um, they cause significant scarring and can affect that cervix's ability um, to to dilate later in the future with future pregnancies. It can also cause cervical incompetence in future pregnancies where the cervix premature dilates on its own and causing loss of the pregnancy. So it is pretty significant when you get cervical tears and they can bleed pretty significantly. They can have internal tears of the vagina as well. Um, so if Usually, if it's lack of tone, they'll have gushes of blood. Um, usually, if it's lacerations, it'll be more of a continuous trickle of blood. So um, sometimes the characteristics can help with that as well. So another um, type of bleeding that's more internal is a hematoma. So a hematoma is more than just a bruise. A hematoma is where you actually have a collection of blood under the skin. So you'll usually notice a swollen area in addition to um, the bruising where that blood is collecting under the skin. You can have massive internal bleeding from a hematoma. Um, so these are important as well to, to recognize and rectify because you can lose a lot of blood that way, especially if you're seeing um, hematoma hemoglobin hematocrit changes or vital sign changes um, and you're not finding any other source of bleeding, it could be um, that they have a hematoma that needs to needs to be treated. Um, so the initial best treatment for this is to use ice packs. Um, depending on the significance, they may need significant amounts of ice to help with this, but ice will help constrict those blood vessels down and at least slow that bleeding down as much as you can.
So when we're talking about late postpartum hemorrhage, the most common cause is retention of placental fragments. Um, so as you can see from the placenta that's in the picture, there's different grooves and nubs um, that are on the placenta. What you're seeing here is the placenta that's attached to the uterus, the mother's side of the placenta. So they will check that when it comes out um, and make sure none of those little points are missing. If there's something missing, then they need to go and remove it from the uterus because if they don't, the body will keep that and it will cause difficulties with the uterus being able to contract and it can also cause infections if it's left in and they go home. Um, so as far as late postpartum hemorrhage, that's the most common cause. It can cause subinvolution. Subinvolution just means where that uterus is not contracting down at the rate that you want it to, uh, which will also cause bleeding as well. So making sure that women know when they go home that progress of normal lochia transitions, when it should go from the lochia rubra to the lochia serosa to the lochia alba, and noting if it goes backwards or if they start having clots when they go home or if they're having those significant after pains that are sp supposed to resolve within three days and they don't, not noticing those symptoms and um, when to contact their provider about it. So another thing that women who are postpartum are more at risk for is thromboembolic disorders or blood clots. And the reason for this is a few things. One, a lot of women may be less um, mobile in their, their third trimester, towards the end of their third trimester, just because of fatigue, um, because of um, their, their imbalances with their changes in their center of gravity. Various different things can make them less mobile um, and less active, but also just the natural process of increasing our clotting um, factors um, because our body is expecting to experience something that will cause bleeding, our body increases clotting factors um, and that increases our risk of DVTs and PEs in the postpartum period. So making sure that we're checking for signs of DVT, like having the patient dorsiflex their foot and looking for pain um, along the backside of the calf, redness, um, as well as signs of PE like difficulty breathing, low-grade fevers, chest pain, crackles, things like that. So the best way to prevent um, a lots of our complications and blood clots is one of them is early and often ambulation. So even in post-op patients and postpartum patients, every single patient, the biggest evidence-based practice we have is early and often ambulation decreases risk of so many complications. So ambulation. So there are three main peripheral infections that um, these patients are at risk for. Peripheral meaning postpartum. It's just another word that you see that means that. Um, so the three main infections that these women are at risk for are endometritis, which is a uterine infection, mastitis, which is a breast infection, and then urinary tract infections. Um, urinary tract infections are because of not only uh, with all that vaginal discharge that they have in the peri area sitting there up uh, near their urethra, but they may have urinary retention as well, which can increase their risk. So making sure they're voiding frequently, um, that they're using good peri care that will help with both the ur urinary tract infections as well as the endometritis, making sure they're washing their hands before and after peri care, before and after breastfeeding, um, because those contaminants that are already on their hands can increase their risk of infection as well. Um, there are lots of factors that can predispose them to these infections. For instance, if they have diabetes, just like in a patient who has pre-existing diabetes, um, where they have risks of infections, patients that either have pre-existing diabetes or develop gestational diabetes, if it's not well controlled, that increases their risk of developing infections as well. It, it increases their risk of having wound dehiscence um, if they have any kind of sutured wounds like cesarean sections or episiotomies or things like that. Um, there are, um, if they have autoimmune disorders or other things that increase their risk of infection, just like in the general population, it increases their risk of infection with these as well. So one of the big ones that you see is mastitis. So mastitis is a lot more common than most people realize. It is an infection of the breast. Unlike 
engorgement. Engorgement is where the breasts get very full, um, especially when the milk first comes in two to three days postpartum. This is an infection. Typically engorgement, or not typically, engorgement is going to be both breasts because it's fullness of the breast, but mastitis more likely is going to be one breast or the other. Um, and it is going to be more significantly painful. Um, the top picture that you see would be pretty unusual. That's more like a an abscess type of situation, but the bottom breast with the redness is more likely what you would see. So redness, um, usually a pain, heavy feeling. Um, some women get like flu-like symptoms where they'll get fevers, um, fatigue, malaise, those kind of things. Um, and it is, it has to be treated with antibiotics being an infection. Um, it also is highly recommended they need to empty their breasts. So as long as there is not an abscess formed, because if there is an abscess, that purulent drainage can get mixed in with the breast milk. But if there is not an abscess, then it is highly encouraged for the mom to continue to breastfeed. Um, those antibodies that mom is creating will help keep ba build baby's immune system. Um, but also mom needs to clear her breasts. If she does not clear th the milk out of her breasts, it's going to get backed up and it's going to make it worse. So if she cannot tolerate breastfeeding because of the pain, she should at least pump or hand express or do something to get the milk out of her breasts because it will get backed up and it will cause significantly worse symptoms. Kind of like when you have a, a boil that you don't drain, it's, it can make it worse. So taking the antibiotics, there are tons of breastfeeding friendly antibiotics out on the market. So there's no reason to stop breastfeeding because of the antibiotics. Um, they can take analgesics like Tylenol um, and ibuprofen, for example, even though pregnant women cannot take, take ibuprofen, breastfeeding women can, so that is safe for them to take. Um, and making sure that they are emptying their breasts, um, making sure they're drinking plenty of fluids, because if they don't drink enough fluids, one, their body's not going to process the antibiotics as well. Um, but also, um, if they're not drinking enough fluids, they're not producing enough milk, and they're not going to be able to get enough um, expression of breast milk to really clear their system. So making sure they're clearing that out um, as often as possible. And then there are three mental health um, complications or disorders uh, that can occur in the postpartum patient. There's postpartum blues, there's postpartum depression, and there is postpartum psychosis. So the one that is completely normal is called postpartum blues or baby blues. You'll often hear it called. Um, this is due to um, hormonal changes that are occurring, hormonal influences um, in the first few days after birth. It's very common. It has symptoms that mimic depression, but usually at a lesser severity. Um, women in this with this will have periods of sadness. They will have um, crying episodes, feelings of inadequacy. They may have some sleep um, and appetite. At appetite disturbances, um, but the the difference in postpartum blues and postpartum depression is time. Postpartum blues, if it is truly postpartum blues, will go away within 10 days postpartum. It doesn't last very long, and it, it is self-limiting and will go away. Um, postpartum depression, on the other hand, lasts beyond 10 days, and it doesn't mean it starts within those 10 days. Postpartum depression is defined as depression that starts any time within the first year of baby's life. So it may not even start until months later. It doesn't necessarily start right at birth. But with postpartum depression, it's either going to start or it's going to continue past that 10 days. Um, so it is, um, usually the, the symptoms are more severe than postpartum blues. They will still have the crying. They will still have the sadness, feelings of worthlessness. They may also have suicidal ideations along with this. Um, it will often impair their ability to function as a parent or, um, as a, a just in general functioning. Um, so this does need to be treated. So postpartum blues, we don't treat, um, we provide emotional support, um, um, teaching for how to care for their children. When it goes into postpartum depression, it needs to be treated. Most commonly, it's going to be treated with your SSRIs, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Prozac is a very common one. Um, a lot of the SSRIs are breastfeeding friendly, so they can continue to take those um, even with breastfeeding. They don't have to stop breastfeeding. 
and they can make a real difference in moms and their ability to function and their mental health as well. Um, some moms have to stay on it forever. It develops into more of a chronic depressive type of scenario, but a lot of moms with postpartum depression may only need to take it a year or two and be able to come off those medications. Postpartum psychosis is a whole different monster. Uh, postpartum psychosis is generally seen in patients with bipolar disorder. Um, and what happens with postpartum psychosis postpartum psychosis is they start out because of those hormonal shifts they will start out in a state of depression um, and when if you know what bipolar disorder is there's two main phases of bipolar disorder there's depressive phase and there is manic phase so when they go into that depressive phase their body will overcompensate and whip them around into a manic phase when they go into the manic phase is when they develop these symptoms of psychosis so it may proceed with um, symptoms like um, hallucinations paranoia um, general psychosis thoughts of grandeur um, uh, racing thoughts, those things that you see with, with psychosis and mania. Um, and then they will develop homicidal and suicidal behaviors or thoughts. Um, these are women you've probably heard many stories over the years. Um, there was a woman about 20 years ago or so um, that put all of her kids in her station wagon in North Carolina and drove it into a river. Um, there was a mom a while ago that um, went to heat up the baby's bottle in the microwave and instead put the baby in the microwave. Um, and there was one not that long ago, just here in Virginia a couple weeks ago, where the mom tried to drown her seven-month-old baby. So it does get to that point where they are in that psychotic phase and they become homicidal and a danger to themselves as well as their children. Um, so this is much more severe. Sometimes these patients might not even know they have bipolar. Bipolar is typically diagnosed in your late 20s or early 30s, so about childbearing age. So sometimes pregnancy could, could bring on those symptoms. Sometimes even if they do know they have it, they might not know um, that it can transcend into into this type of, of situation. So um, it is going to be a situation where the mom gets admitted and they are going to be put on antipsychotic medications. Unfortunately, all antipsychotic medications do pass through breast milk. They are not breastfeeding friendly. So moms who have postpartum psychosis and are medicated are not going to be able to breastfeed any longer um, because of the risk versus benefit of those medications. It is much more important that they get those medications to maintain their psychosis um, than breastfeeding. So um, with those patients, they need to be monitored for homicidal, suicidal behaviors and behaviors such as psychosis and paranoia that indicate they may be going into a psychosis type of phase.